Rog asked us to give short talks about research in progress and to be rough and ready. Um, so that's what I'm going to be. I can't promise um, the philosophical depth that Nathan provided uh, or indeed the PowerPoints that the others have used. Um, so there's no entertainment here, just some afraid words. Um, what I'm going to talk about is one of a series of three or four proposals or research proposals, fairly short, you know, sort of four to six month proposals that, we're, that we put in very recently with um, with a major uh, international IT firm. So John, this is a case of one research institute flocking to one firm, you might say. Um, uh, a series of three or four over the, over the remainder of this year. And this is one that I've called here the hybrid governance of cyberspace. And it's actually, in actual fact, it's gonna be something that, uh, that Ryan and I will both be working on. Uh, I beg your pardon, Nathan and I will both be working on. Um, so here's some preambular words. Um, the first, very generally, I think we'd all agree that cyberspace is an environment of opportunity, of cooperation and fulfillment, uh, all these good things on the one hand, uh, but it's also an environment for contention, uh, predation and confrontation on the other. Uh, on the other. It's also extremely popular. Uh, according to the ITU, uh, by the end of 2015, there could be something like 3.2 billion users of the internet around the world of a global population of something like 7 billion. Uh, that's the ITU's estimate. I mean, forgive me for using this, these numbers again. As someone said earlier, where on earth do they get these figures from? Uh, and who knows? Um, the rate of internet adoption, I think we can all agree more solidly, solidly has been very rapid. The ITU estimate uh, that uh, there were just around about 400 million users of the internet in 2000. Well, listen to Eric Schmidt's uh, prediction. He claimed that by the end of the current decade, the entire global population will be online. A lot of people have thought, well, that's a little bit over the top. So let's take a slightly more uh, conservative um, estimate. Let's say just two thirds of humanity might be online by 2020. Well, that rate of take up, if that's right, uh, is, can only be described as momentous. Uh, 400 million to 5 billion or thereabouts in 20 years, a pretty good um, return on investment, you might say. Um, and this is a momentous take up, not just technologically, um, but also, I, th I think more significantly in terms of, of politics. Um, this expanding global um, uh, communication infrastructure brings with it the possibility of what I've called here a worldwide conversation across all dimensions and at all levels of human life. Cultural, economic, religious, diplomatic, commercial, family, individual, non-governmental, and governmental. You name it, it's in there somewhere. Um, communication and conversation are also, this is the flip side, made possible for criminal, terrorist, and other adverse behaviors. All of that is, of course, very familiar to all of us. But in spite, or maybe because of this rate of take up, I don't think that humanity has yet acquired sufficient familiarity. It goes back to uh, this discussion of normal we were having last night, the sense of normality. Uh, we don't have sufficient familiarity with this relatively new form of communication and, infra and, and information transfer to know with enough confidence the identifiers of good and bad or acceptable and non-acceptable behavior at any given moment. We're just not quite fully comfortable with it yet. Um, I would argue that cyberspace is not yet susceptible to the forms of mature political organization which are, uh, with which we're familiar. And as a result, it lies outside uh, frameworks with which we've traditionally expected to manage and to moderate um, competition and conflict and even organized violence in the international system. So here's the problem as I see it. <clears throat> Cyberspace is neither the uh, digital equivalent of the lawless Wild West on the one hand, nor is it a closely controlled political arena in which the rules of the road are universally understood and implemented. It's neither of those two things. The supervision, organization, regulation, and even the governance of cyberspace are in transition. Um, very probably, I suggest, this is my guess, towards a point somewhere between those two extremes. Um, but as so often, this middle ground is so much harder to describe and to occupy than either of the extremes. Uh, this is, in a sense, a large part of our challenge. I'd say that productive human interaction of any sort, in any environment, can't usually take place without a governance framework uh, of some sort, involving values, uh, rules, laws, norms, standards, codes, and so on and so forth. 
Even non-productive or destructive human interaction often takes place within such a framework. The regulation of the conduct of war is a very useful uh, and timely illustration. Um, governance frameworks, in my view, are not optional. They are inevitable. Um, they're both necessary to the task at hand, whether it's regulating war or establishing protocols for commercial interaction, as well as being fundamentally human. It is what we do, insofar as we prefer order and predictability and fairness in our interactions. There's something uh, intrinsically, innately human about this. So I think, I'd argue that the governance of cyberspace is best described um, as work in progress, and it takes place on these two fronts. We get the so-called norm entrepreneurs on the one hand, advocating the design and adoption of codes and standards as a means to socialize, in a sense, socialize and stabilize um, cyberspace, either as a whole, the most ambitious, uh, or in discrete sectors, so in manufacturing industry, uh, in the media, in research and innovation, and so on. Um, very difficult questions have to be addressed in that process of norm entrepreneurship and norm transference. What precisely are the values and norms which should govern behaviours in cyberspace? Should these norms be generally applicable or should they be sectorally specific? Who or what should be responsible for developing and implementing these norms? And under whose authority? And as much as norms can be developed prescriptively or by design, if you like, they can also evolve spontaneously and organically through practice. This is, again, is very human. Um, and this process of norm evolution, as I've called it here, can also see adaptive responses resulting from cross-pollination between different sectors. So the research questions for this um, small project, hybrid, the hybrid governance of, uh, of cyberspace, are as follows. The governance of cyberspace could plausibly, therefore, um, be developed in at least one of two ways, um, uh, which I've just described. Either this instrumental um, governance by design on the one hand, or more evolutionary governance by practice on the other. Even so, as the technological sophistication of, the, of cyberspace continues to deepen, and as cyberspace reaches um, further and further into uh, ever more geographic and cultural environments, any form of governance, I think, is likely to face periodic and perhaps even chronic uh, challenge as cyberspace itself continues to evolve. This thing is moving all the time, as we all know. Uh, so in the context of, this, um, of these shifting circumstances, um, we're wondering in this project whether what we've called hybrid governance um, might have the advantage of being not only conceptually coherent, well, that's for you to judge, uh, but also practically efficient and effective and durable. By allowing different approaches and ideas and influences and objectives, in a sense, to blend on demand, uh, could a hybrid governance structure offer the necessary resilience, being able to adapt to change and to withstand stress, to adopt and to socialise new cultural and societal preferences, and as a result, could it be more likely to be both durable and even global? Um, finally, I think we should also consider issues of implementation. While the normative basis of the governance of cyberspace is a very compelling political philosophical problem, of course it is, this is why I think we're all so fascinated by this, it is also a practical matter of urgent global public policy um, concern. So there you have it. Don't over-engineer the governance of cyberspace, but don't be too incremental and too complacent, on the other hand, either. Allow, uh, what is the expression, a hundred flowers to bloom. How are we going to go about this? We've got what we call around work packages. So WP1 is basically the paper that says this is where we are at the moment with the global uh, cyber norms debate. It happens to be something I've worked on for several years with, with colleagues in Tallinn at the NATO CCD COE. Uh, and so we'll be extending um, some of that work. Essentially a desk-based review of where we are at the moment in the global norms debate. <laughs> then we've got a cyberspace governance workshop. Um, which in many respects is going to be the most um, interesting part of this little project. Um, we have a forecasting and backcasting workshop. Um, Rand, if you know Rand, uh, the Dr. Strange Love thing, the Bland Corporation, etc., etc. Rand loves games and it loves numbers. Um, in the forecasting phase of this workshop, 
Um, we're going to draw upon contemporary circumstances, um, actual or likely policy choices, and external trends and drivers and shocks, all of these things to describe three plausible future cyberspace governance scenarios. And we've called the first intergovernmental, the second the transition, in other words, it's still evolving, we don't really know where it's going, uh, and the third the multi-stakeholder. So those are the two extremes again, the intergovernmental, the Chinese, the multi-stakeholder, the rest. <clears throat> In the backcasting phase, we then get our workshop participants to imagine themselves in one of the three scenarios uh, from which they'll look back to identify uh, these policy choices, external trends, drivers and shocks, etc., which in their view will have contributed most to the, emergency, to the emergence of the respective governance scenario. And that's basically it in a nutshell. We have a fourth group as well, Group D, uh, and their job is simply, they're the kind of exercise reference in a sense, uh, and their job is simply to provide uh, an independent forecast of the most likely state of global cyberspace governance in 2015, um, suggesting how norms and norm entrepreneurs might have contributed to its emergence. And once they've done that, then they can go to have a cup of tea. They don't need to think backwards. So that's it. Now, Carl Goyser, uh, ANU College of Law student. Um, given that the uh, the dark web is described as being many times larger than the, the, the normal internet. And I, I've been on the internet for many, many years and I haven't been in touch with it. Given that that's the case, isn't cyberspace rather than being uh, one, one sort of space, isn't it a whole load of separate spaces that makes it infinitely large? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, I caution infinite. <laughs> infinite is maybe not. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we're talking here about the nice web. We're not talking about the dark web or the deep web because, by definition, these are beyond the policy debate. Uh, I'm not trying to be glib and escape your, your your challenge. I mean, I think it's a hugely important challenge. There's an awful lot of everything we're discussing today that is completely and utterly beyond uh, our control. Certainly, our imagining. Possibly, um, who knows what goes on there. How do you get into it? Um, how do you, again, it's a paradox. I mean, how can you possibly bring uh, norms of governance and so on into areas which are by definition beyond governance? So I'm evading your question. <laughs> I've got a question for you around the telemetry. Um, from what I understand, and this might not be the case, but from what I understand, it was put forward, so telemetry was a bunch of international legal experts looking at relations between uh, cyber and and international, uh, international law in relation to warfare. Um, from what I understand, it was put out um, that it, there's been a pretty limited uptake and response to it, um, in part because of the, the, compo the composition of the, the people involved in producing it and in part in the way in which it was put out. So, first of all, is the, have you found that that's the case with the Talent Manual, that there's been limited you know, international response to it? And if that is the case, or even if it's not, um, what lessons can you take or have you taken from Talon in terms of establishing these norms, um, you know, kind of top-down models, bottom-up models, etc.? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, where we are with the Talon Manual, um, Talon Manual 1.0, um, is, as you said, what it, essentially what it said was international humanitarian law applies. That's it. That's the big, and it goes through it in great detail. It's a very good read and very well structured and so on. Um, the problem is, though, it was adopted by, I don't know how many, um, not adopted, uh, read. <laughs> well, I don't know how many governments who thought, well, very good, well done. Um, and it certainly has been adopted, I think, by the ICRC. So it's got a lot of credibility, but it hasn't been adopted by China, for example, who said, well, so what? Um, this wasn't, didn't go through the UN. What's it got to do with you? And so on. So th there is a kind of bit of a stumbling block there. Where they are at the moment is um, they're, coming, they're trying to work through Tallinn 2.0, which will be, um, you know, you'll know this very well in the sort of classic history of Geneva and Hague Conventions that you get through the basics and then you have to think about the more difficult cases, which are non-state warfare. So how do you apply international humanitarian law to non-state cyber warfare? I mean, a huge challenge. I mean, where do you go with that? So that's what they're stuck on at the moment. Um, I think they're aiming to produce 2.0 by the end of this year. So watch this space. My, uh, what do I take from it most of all? I think... Um, what seems to me to be most obviously missing from 
um, 1.0 and probably from 2.0 is, in a sense, it goes back to the discussion you and I had just a few minutes ago after your um, excellent talk. It, it's really, it doesn't really, for me, get into the implementation enough. I, at the moment, I want something more than that's just all about saying it applies. I want to know how and why. That seems to me to what's to be what's actually distinctively challenging about cyberspace at the moment. Just don't just sort of declare that goodness ought to reign in cyberspace. Show me how it can. You see what I mean? Um, so that's where where I am at the moment. That's my problem with with the Tallinn process at the moment. My question is in terms of what I think Roger's presentation was about. Wouldn't more governance to some degree create more vulcanisation to some degree? Because if you take away governance, you're actually left with, I suppose, a free-ranging internet, um, no rules, no laws, and that's basically the basis of the whole invention of the internet. So the more governance you have, the more normative behaviour you're imposing or uh, saying that's acceptable on in society, doesn't that tend towards to drive you towards vulcanisation? Or is it just my imagination? No, I think that's a really good question. I think if if by governance what we had in mind was something closer to government, then I think I'd agree with you. Um, this would be, you know, we probably, many of us here feel slightly nervous about big government. This would be the biggest possible ever government. Um, and I'd feel kind of wary about that too. Um, but this isn't government. This is governance, which ought to be both a matter of, you know, governance by design, and I was saying, but also that kind of human bottom-up sort of thing. We like this. We like to have predictability and... Uh, and trust and all those sorts of good things. Um, so I, I think, um, that, so not necessary is my answer. But one of, one of the things I'm going to be talking about tonight really is, is trying to suggest that at the moment what we need to be doing is allowing both things to be happening. We need to be pursuing the global governance um, idea while at the same time allowing that there are these separated governance structures building up. And they are there. And there's nothing I can do about them to stop them uh, or any of us here. They are there. So in a sense, we have to accept the obvious that these two, the very valid, the very good ideas that we're all, we all agreeing with on the one hand and, and this rather diminished version on the other, it exists. So somehow we've got to get ourselves into the habit of thinking um, or allowing both of them to coexist for the time being thanks. until the liberal triumph happens. Ah, yes. Thanks, <coughs> thanks very much. Um, I think we might, might close there. Uh, in closing, I'll remind you that Paul's speaking tonight, a public lecture on quantum sovereignty and the Westphalian principle. Uh, he'll be extending some of these ideas, but you must come to the lecture to find out what he really means by that intriguing title. So I'd like, I'd like to thank him. Thank you very much. Thank you. And hand over to Terry Bossemeyer, who's going to talk about tipping points. We're going from pulsi to physics. Um, so I'm going to talk about a range of, range of different projects, all, all uh, surrounding the idea of tipping points and particularly how these uh, might have particular influence within uh, the cyberspace domain. So as Roger's already indicated, we're talking very much about complex systems where we have very many interacting entities, uh, agents of one sort or another, and the, the interactions between these, uh, these various agents can produce interesting uh, system level behaviours which you wouldn't likely predict from the behaviour of the individuals involved. So there's a, a huge amount of theoretical work in this area now. The things which are going to be particularly interesting to us in this talk are the ideas of, of networks um, and uh, system level measures for uh, behaviour of, of, of complex systems. And as Roger's talk um, uh, illustrate this simulation as a, as a key methodology uh, for uh, studying these sorts of problems. So we're, we cover a whole range of things from, from the use of, of big data, very large data sets collected about people, the way people behave from supermarket records through to mobile phone metadata. Um, we've been using these sorts of approaches to look at behaviour of, uh, of people and aspects of human brain and the particular bits that I'm going to actually select out today relate to, uh, to tipping points uh, TP. So Roger's already given a, a brief description of tipping points. We've uh, looked at them over a range of different areas. 
Uh, networks play a key, a key role as well. Um, so the connectivity distributions of networks, whether they're scale-free, as, as Roger was talking about, or whether they've got uh, other characteristics, can very much determine the stability of these networks, which we'll come to when we talk about resilience of, of norms and uh, how this might relate to resilience and, and ev evolution of cyber norms. And uh, uh, the uh, characteristic of, of many networks um, is that they may themselves embody tipping points or, or phase transitions. So certain, certain properties of the network may, may lead you <coughs> from one network state to another state, which is to some extent the sort of characteristic that Roger was talking about with balkanization. So tipping points are, are sort of effectively big sudden changes. Um, a tipping point was a, possibly made popular as a term by Malcolm Gladwell in the book of the same name. Um, uh, it's a fairly kind of loose term and we're uh, interested perhaps in the more specific term of phase transitions used in statistical physics. Well, if there's any statistical physics here, my terminology is going to be a bit, a bit slack at times. Um, but there's quite a lot of different types of tipping point, which is of, of phase transition, which is important in actually identifying them in real world systems. But what we can do is we can study what we call cano canonical models. These are really very simple, very simple models. And there's one of the most important things about many of these phase transitions is the concept of universality. So there's only a relatively small number of different types of transition. And by studying the simple, simple models, we can make use of this universality principle to see how these will apply to, to kind of real world systems. Uh, so one of the things we need then, and one of the things which drives us is, is a search for indicators of tipping points. And there's a variety of these doing the rounds at the moment. The first is, uh, as you get close to some sort of tipping point, you get increased variance. So uh, the stock market at the moment is, is displaying unusually high level of variance at the beginning of this year. Whether or not this is indicative of a, well, it's already possibly in a bear market, whether it's going to crash seriously, is anybody's guess, at least. Right. Um, a more, another idea which is somewhat more recent is the idea of critical slowing down. Right. And I'll, I'll try and explain exactly how that appears a bit later on in the talk. But the idea of critical slowing down is that if you've got a system which is close to a tipping point, then if you, if you give it a prod, if you kick it, it will take longer and longer and longer to recover. Right? So a system which is well away from the tipping point may recover very quickly. But as you get closer and closer to the point where you're going to go over the edge, it takes longer and longer to recover from a small perturbation, uh, a, small, a small prod, a small gun. Uh, and uh, right near the end, we'll talk about some technical measures that something called global transfer entropy. Um, and uh, I, all, the, all the technical bit comes right near the end, so if you want to have an early lunch, uh, this, would be, this would be the opportunity to take it. Uh, um, so, uh, the particular type of transition we're interested in is something which we call a disorder <coughs> to disorder transition, where you go from a, a state which is essentially disordered, where lots of, lots of agents, lots of people are, are all doing their own thing, to one which is very ordered. Right. So order can be good, so you can have, for example, coherent traffic, flocks of birds uh, form, uh, form uh, coherent, coherent entities which can, which can uh, makes the, their flight more efficient. Um, some people in the neuroscience world suggest that consciousness is, is a, uh, a property of, kind of whole brain integration, that the whole brain is functioning in, in, a, in a coherent way. It can also be bad, so if we get all people in a stock market buying or selling at the same time in a property market where everybody buys and everybody sells, you get a bubble or a crash, in which case the order's, the order's bad. Um, and if you take the consciousness uh, as whole brain integration to the point where the, the brain is, is operating in a, in a kind of pulsating rhythmical fashion, you have an epileptic fit. 
So order may be, may be good or bad, but we're interested in the transition from disorder to order. And the key idea, the key idea at an intuitive level, um, is that if you want to go from disorder to order, you need information flow between the elements of the system. Because the information flow is necessary to get the, to get the, the ordering to work. You know, if, you want, if you want any order to develop in any system, then, the, then the essential agents need to synchronize it with one another. So information has to flow. And so what we want to do is to be able to measure information flow in the most general possible way. Right. So this is an um, uh, example of, of uh, work being done with, with colleagues in the University of Tasmania. They've done a lot of work studying, uh, studying tipping points in, in ecosystems. So this, this thing on the left is a giant lobster. I'm sort of this, still sort of this, I haven't realised lobsters could get so big. The Tasmanian lobsters are the only creature large and, and fierce enough to devour the thing on the right, uh, which is a sea urchin. And if a sea urchin is left unchecked, um, it will eat away and completely complete, render a, a, coral, a, a coral reef completely barren. It will just basically eat all the seaweed and, and you end up with essentially rocks. Um, and these seaweed forests, kelp forests, are very important for marine ecosystems. Lots, lots, of, lots of little fish and all kinds of other things live in there. Right. And so uh, the Tasmanian, Tasmanian people have done a, a huge amount of work on this showing that uh, you can get a, effectively a, a tipping point um, in, um, in the density of the, of the seaweed. So there, up this, this is essentially seaweed, and this is, is uh, lobster, uh, sorry, not lobster, up sea urchin density. And you get this very sharp transition from lots of seaweed to no seaweed. So I won't bother with very many more of the details of that. And that's actually what we call first order transition. Right. Another problem we're interested in is, uh, is, the, uh, is the resilience and stability of things like shopping malls. Right. So um, this is a, a picture from somewhere in the United States where a shopping mall has just kind of eventually crashed and burnt. It's just a kind of a open shell now inhabited by kind of rats and birds. Right. And what happens, uh, or can happen, and in many ways we, in many sort of situations, particularly in regional, regional areas, we don't want this to happen, is where you get um, so positive feedback effect where some shops leave. It makes it less desirable for people to go to the mall, so fewer people, fewer people go, um, and, uh, and therefore more shops close down, eventually, eventually no more. <coughs> and uh, since these provide uh, uh, kind of entertainment and, and other uh, uh, jobs and everything else. This can actually be quite important. So this aspect of, of things like competition from online online sales um, can potentially bring about um, this sort of uh, transition to um, a loss of these ma major shopping centres. Right. Um, the work that we've been doing on information flows done with the University of Sussex, and this is a photograph taken of starlings, European starlings, over the, uh, the old Brighton Pier. Um, and there's these, these uh, birds collecting flocks of about 40,000. And if you watch them, a, a static picture doesn't do justice to them, because when you watch them at night, you, you'll see that they, these huge flocks produce the most amazing, amazing kind of flow patterns. It's very, and they produce these this, um, amazingly, amazingly di diverse and, and synchronised behaviour without any central control. So each starling is only interested in what its imme immediate neighbours are doing. And yet somehow the, that, um, the flock behaviour um, is, is, is large scale. It's got here, and I said, in the case of these birds, about 40, 50,000 birds. Now, coming to sort of human agents, um, this shows uh, a, uh, a stock market crash. So on the, t on the top, you've got the Dow Jones Index, the Dow Jones Index, uh, you know, US uh, stock market uh, index, uh, which has a, a dip um, 
dip here. Uh, and associated with that dip is, is a peak. Uh, again, we won't go into any of the details in the, in the time available, but essentially what we have is a peak in a measure of the extent to which people are all doing the same thing. Right, so you've got a stock market crash, which basically means everybody is selling. So instead of some people wanting to buy this and sell that, everybody is doing the same, th same thing. Everybody is selling and the stock market goes past that. Right. Um, so we want to measure that degree of, uh, of a cooperative behavior uh, amongst all the, uh, all the trading agents. Right. And so this uh, looks at this in a slightly different way in that now we've got um, 80, uh, well, 100 and 130 equities, 128 actually, um, on, the, on the left, uh, on the y-axis, and, and date going on, time axis going along the x-axis. And basically what this color shows is the degree of, of cooperation between uh, the, the, the equities themselves, so the actual shares Share prices show a very strong, very strong uh, collaboration, as you can see by this kind of um, bright red band in the in the middle. Right. Uh, now, um, staying now within the in the uh, neural domain, there's quite a lot of uh, work going on now, uh, showing. Uh, the existence of tipping points in the in the human brain in psychology and human cognition. So we showed, for example, that there is a transition uh, in the development of expertise in the game of Go. Go is very fashionable at the moment. It was actually on the cover of Nature uh, in the last couple of weeks because Google have just succeeded in uh, in developing a Go program which could, which has beaten the European Go champion. Uh, for a long time, Go was just way, way, way too hard for computers. Um, but it's made headline, headline news in the last month. But there have been a, a series of articles which show, for example, um, the measurement of tipping points for depression. So when somebody falls into uh, depression, in some cases this is not a gradual slide, but actually a, a, a tipping point where at one point they're depressed, or not depressed anymore, the next, next point they are. Um, migraine uh, uh, has p appeared quite recently, trying to, looking for uh, neuro uh, signatures for the development of migraine headaches, consciousness. We've talked about epilepsy, we, we've mentioned already. And one of the issues that Roger and I have been talking about is whether or not these neurocognitive transitions underlie the, uh, the change from somebody who is uh, is maybe kind of disillusioned or unhappy to somebody who will commit acts of terrorism. Right? Because there's a big change from, from, being, uh, from being unhappy, maybe a, maybe a petty criminal or whatever, to uh, walking into a crowd of people with a suicide bomb. Right. And, right. So in the case, oh, okay. <coughs> so, uh, in the case of Go, we see a big change in the the difference between amateur and professional players in terms of the way they look at the board. Um, social norms, um, uh, which, as uh, Paul was saying, are, are critically important in, uh, in, in, cyber, uh, uh, in the cyberspace world, tend to be actually very resilient. And since, sci since, act since, since IT is moving so fast, this resilience is particularly important <coughs> issue. So a lot of work has been done by Peyton Young at Oxford on this, and there are uh, examples of where medical, medical treatment is determined not so much by the actual symptoms and the best treatment option, but by the actual local culture, medical culture corresponding to uh, whether the age group, uh, depending upon the age demographic. Right. So, to, to then uh, get to the, the very far, the technical, technical end, uh, um, the, sorts of, the sorts of systems we look at, simple systems, are things like cellular automata, uh, where uh, you have um, 
uh, very simple, um, very simple systems with simple rules of behaviour which can lead to very complicated behaviour. And they show the same characteristics of, uh, of tipping points of the, of the real systems we've looked at um, uh, with um, uh, uh, a, close analogy, a, a, close, a close link to random graphs, which is in some ways similar to what Roger was talking about, but it, this is effectively the inverse of vulcanization, where you get what's called a, cap, a, a tipping point, you get a, a connectivity avalanche in the graph, where in this collection of, of small subgraphs, sub networks, when you add the red connections, you add just a couple of connections and, and the system goes to being essentially fully connected. Um, so the way we deal with all of this is through looking at, through looking at, at statistics. So for example, you can have statistics of cat color and you can look at, at, look at um, how one thing predicts another. So if you know that the cat's blue, then you have almost no information about whether it's male or female. But if a cat's a tricolor, like the one down on the left, uh, you know it's female. Uh, so that's what we call mutual information, which is the, uh, I was never intending to try and explain these formulae, but the idea of mutual information is how much one thing tells you about something else. So how much the color of a cat tells you about its gender. Um, the more recent idea is transfer <coughs> entropy, which measures information flow. Uh, and information flow is closely related to mutual information, but uh, it's looking at how one thing influences another. Uh, so we've then uh, looked at one of the simple models called the IC model, which is a, a model of, of spins, for, uh, which can either point up or down, as, uh, shown here and these, spin, these spins show a remarkable uh, phase transition where they will essentially uh, be all completely disordered or they will all, they will all line up again uh, skipping over lots and lots of details here and then what we were able to show um, was that uh, these all the indicators that I talked about a critical slide down the uh, the increased variance, they come to a maximum peak at the, at the point of the phase transition. So down here, the red line shows the position of the transition. And the mutual information and the transfer entropy between each, each pair of spins peaks actually at the transition itself. But a new measure, which we introduced the global transfer entropy, peaks in a different place. It peaks on the disordered side with the, uh, where the green line is. So effectively, it's a, it's a predictor of a disorder to order transition. So, the, so the, the red line here is the transition and the green line is here, which is the, the peak of the global, the global transfer entropy. Right. So we've got some new theoretical ideas. Um, uh, testing these things for real data uh, makes huge computational demands. You need large amounts of data to do this. But some of the new data sources which are, which are becoming available now for studying, for studying social phenomena, for studying academics and so forth, give us the possibility um, of, uh, of getting some predictive tools for predicting changes in individual behavior or changes in cultural norms. That's right. Thank you, Terry. Thank you very much. I should, I should mention that Terry's being a little too modest. His uh, transfer entropy work has been published in one of the most prestigious physics journals and is getting uh, a lot of abuzz because, uh, as he modestly said, it, it, it's predictive of these, of these sorts of changes. So the work that we can now do, looking at the way norms might change, looking at the way uh, the internet may organise, particularly in networks, is for the first time We've got the possibility of getting to grips on prediction of those catastrophic and, and uh, very hard to understand events, predicting uh, that they may be, that they're likely to occur with a very high probability. And it's just never been possible before. So this is a real advance in our ability to handle this level of complexity for this level of, for this level of real world problems to do with the management and uh, governance and control of, of the internet.
So I'll take some. I'll <coughs> take a few questions for Terry. Uh, Terry, I'm wondering if you've um, modelled the collapse of that shopping centre to see what that looks like, and as a parallel to that, I'm not sure if you know about the two degree um, housing development in the United States that was demolished in the 1960s. Um, it was basically a progressive thing. So it sounds, sounds like pretty much the same sort of phenomenon with the supermarket. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, we've, bit, we've built um, simple models um, similar to the, the ones that Roger, Roger was describing for balkanisation to look at uh, this collapse phenomenon. And we've just collected um, data uh, from 100 malls around Australia to look at um, uh, statistics of different, um, um, different uh, retail categories. Um, so we can start using that data to actually parameterise the simple models and then to uh, take it towards, the, the, to, to look for the sorts of uh, stresses or changes which would bring about more collapse. So that's essentially work, on, work ongoing. Thank you. Uh, another question? Yes. Uh, Frank Schler from uh, Australian Federal Police. I was just wondering, has any kind of um, modelling been done around the effect of what cybercrime could have to the internet, um, sort of around that kind of work? Um, not, not that we've done. Uh, I don't know. Um, I don't know of that. But it, but it's potentially one of the triggers that we're talking about for, for changes in, in internet structure. But that's not something I'm familiar with. So would there be an interest there? Or? Oh yes, it would be. It would be extremely interesting. Yes. We've, we've also had a, had, we're also having a look as we speak at, at the idea of, of uh, changes of radicalisation of, of individuals that be, uh, through, their, through their texts on the internet, uh, that, that we might be able to use these techniques, these very advanced techniques, to predict the likelihood that, that this, this teenager in a, in, in a basement is, will become radicalised but before they become radicalised. And this would give uh, police and social, social systems the ability to intervene before the radicalisation occurs. Uh, and so that's, but that's still a very uh, uh, early stage research project. Um, quick, quick, though, I'm thinking in terms of how things go viral, whether it's mm. a tweet or a mm. meme, mm. And, and how then you get relational viral effects from it. Have you modelled some of those? Because I think that's a really interesting phenomenon uh, in terms of uh, the shaping out of sets of relationships. No, it's, very, it's a very interesting problem. We haven't done very much work on that, but one of the things that we've been doing in the, the study of shopping malls is precisely the issue of viral marketing mm. and the extent to which um, uh, the decisions people make about whether to use online services or bricks and mortar retailing uh, are dependent upon um, uh, 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 essentially social media word of mouth. Well, we've got a PhD student who's just finishing, uh, just writing up now, who's been studying uh, ecotourism in the uh, in one of the wetland areas on the uh, uh, New South Wales Victorian border, and uh, one of the models that she developed looked at. Uh, looked at essentially viral marketing, <coughs> mar marketing by essentially kind of word, word of mouth, social network marketing for, uh, for developing ecotourism in, in that area. So it's, a, it's extremely, extremely interesting and we, we've started to look at a couple of cases of it. And, uh, uh, and it, can be effective, it, can be, it can be really very effective, it can be very, very effective in terms of cost and very effective in terms of speed. Yes. Um, in terms of the indicators and influences that you use, um, is there a way that you sort of uh, distinguish between causal versus correlational? So you've got to be very, very careful about what's really yes, yes. causing that yes. Uh, yes. versus yes. Yes. this is yes. just a yes. correlation and you could end up going yes. completely yes. wrong track. Yeah, no, this is, this, this is matter deep and dangerous. Uh, uh, yes, well, uh, one of the things, of course, you have to do is to condition out other influences. Right? Um, and one of the, the this, is, this is kind of a very technical issue, but one of the, one of the things that, that essentially led to the idea of transfer entropy over mutual information is that mutual information measures effectively correlation plus um, all nonlinear 
Uh, so it's effectively a more powerful, more general measure for looking about whether one thing, whether, whether two things have got kind of any shared, shared information of one sort or another. Um, if you then want to look at whether one thing causes something else, you've got to make sure that you don't have a common cause. Right. Um, so, uh, because a common cause could make it look as if two things were connected, when in fact it's the common cause that's doing that. So, the, one, one example that is as if you, if you see a kind of a, a uh, your, your garden suddenly seems to have kind of more snakes and cats in it. Right? You might think that there was something going on between snakes and cats. Whereas it might actually be that there's just been an increase in the number of mice. And both snakes and cats like mice. Right? So you then need to, um, to adopt a statistical procedure of conditioning out the effect of the snakes, at which point you see there's no behavior, there's no link between, between cats and snakes. So yeah, this is a this very, very important issue for them, uh, uh, not that the point of view. Okay, uh, I think we might close off there. Uh, and firstly, thank you all for coming today. We've, we've had a ball. I hope you've enjoyed it. It's been a, a potpourri of uh, different sorts of talks. Uh, I might remind you that Paul, as I said, is talking is doing a public lecture tonight. Uh, Fred Kate, the Vice Chancellor for Research at Indiana University, who hasn't arrived yet because of it, because American Airlines delightfully cancelled his flight initially. He's been having schedule, but he'll be getting here tomorrow. He's giving a he's giving a talk tomorrow evening uh, on cyber and the law in the broader, in the broader sense, and that's a public lecture. And John is giving a public lecture on Thursday uh, on the cross cross domain deterrent China, China and China Cybersecurity Portal. China and Cybersecurity. At the China in the World Centre. So it's not here. It's over. It's co it's co-hosted by China in the World Centre. So that'll that'll be a, that'll be a good evening. And we we're having some more research workshops that you might wish to attend. And one tomorrow which is looking uh, with uh, Herb Lin from Stanford University, who is looking at uh, well we'll be looking at how do you how do you shape up a game-changing research agenda for cyber in general for Australia, uh, and what contributions can Australia make to the global effort in, in cyberspace research. And on Thursday, we're having our next steps uh, uh, <coughs> workshop on where we might go with, with our strategy and statecraft in cyberspace program. So if you've got an interest in those, please contact us and we'll give you an invitation to attend those as well. So, thank you very much, Terry. Thank you.